Um, gentlemen, thank you. Uh, there was also a, there was a risk at one point. Staff was saying we were going to have three Chris's. Niall, it's nice to have you here to break up the Chris factor of the panel. Um, but I think it's still going to cause some confusion. Um, the we're going to talk about change management, but we're going to kind of go all over the map, and it can also be a little free form. So I think some people prepared answers, and some people did not. I didn't. That's, I wasn't calling anyone out. That wasn't, a, that wasn't supposed to be a shaming exercise. I think it's good to be off the cuff. Um, the first question I have, it's a question I asked a lot this year, and that is, you know, a lot has changed, and we saw it in Daniel's data. Um, we had a lot of anomalous stuff happened in, I don't know, something happened in 2020. I don't, I don't remember. Something weird happened, uh, COVID happened, and um, now we're mostly out of that, but we still have a bit of a COVID hangover. Uh, the question is really, are we in a new normal or are we back to normal? I, I mean, I have my own opinion. The question almost answers itself. But um, do you think it's, are we, is, you know, based on your business, uh, who you sell to, the brands you sell from, for, uh, is this, you know, we're back to normal, it's just everything's normal again, or is this like new normal, never to be, you know, undone or revisited, changed, we're never getting back to 2019. What do you think, gentlemen? Chris Sage, I'm looking at you. He's got, he's always choosing me first for some reason. I, I am, I called you out when I was presenting before. Well, look, it's, it's certainly changed. Um, I think, obviously, like you mentioned, COVID has uh, it made the business evolve in such a way that people are now able to do at their fingertip finding out what they need. And that's a good thing. Um, I think that one of the biggest things that we're seeing is our people have not yet uh, adapted to the, the norm that we used to have, which is taking care of clients following up because it was easy to sell a car. Now it's becoming like it used to be. Competition, payments, particularly now with the economy. I think it's more important now than ever before to really build those relationships with your clients. Um, that'd be my take. That's a good one. Beaten, what do you got? <laughs> Are we back to normal? You know, is the car business ever normal? Uh, what is normal? You know, uh, if you look at all the, the external Things in the in play right now, where there's, you look at interest rates, for example. You know, uh, you look at uh, all the conflict going around the world right now. You look at uh, all the elections on the. You got an election coming up south of the border. We have an election coming up north of the border. What's that going to do to all these things at the same time as well, right? You know, you look at EVs. You know, for the last number of years, we've been go go go. Z mandates 2035. What's going to happen in a year if we're going to get a if we're going to get a uh, leadership change in the country, right? So there's a lot of things to play, and I don't I don't I don't know what's good, what's going to happen. I don't think it's going to be a normal uh, that, and I think the big thing is just changing consumer expectations. You know, you look at uh, millennials becoming the dominant buying force in the market, and what their expectations are from you know customer experience. We have a changing workforce that's changing how we deliver customer experience at the store. And then, uh, you know, like Neil talked about earlier with, the, with the, all the Chinese manufacturers, what's that, gonna, what's that going to do? So I don't think it's safe to say we're, we're, things are normal. I think things are going to get even more complicated. But that's the car business. I, I agree. Now, um, I would support what's been said earlier. The car business is a dynamic business. It's constantly changing. So I don't think it's a new normal or old normal. It's the car business, and it's constantly going to evolve. Um, I kind of subscribe to the e experience economy by Joseph Pine. And um, one of the things that he spoke about is that the commodity-focused companies do well when the market isn't like it's on an upswing, which is what we experienced and enjoyed in 22, 23. Um, commodity-focused businesses suffer in a downturn, which is kind of where we are today. And we sell a commodity, unfortunately, in the dealership. And anything do that's... The, do the OEMs know that? Uh, yeah, they... Is there any o OEM people? In there? They okay. may not want to accept... <laughs> they may not want to accept that fact that they sell okay, a commodity. Just checking. Just checking. Uh, but anything that, anything that could be... We call it, commoditizes, loses value. Right? So as car dealers, how do we... How do we create an experience for the guests 
that takes away that transaction. I'm no longer buying a car, I'm no longer buying service, I'm no longer buying a part, but I'm buying an experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, that's where the real, that's where the real um, rubber kind of hits the road. Yeah, yeah, good answer. Um, and because this is, you know, we want to talk about change, we want to talk about retooling. I actually had a different question I kind of wanted to squeeze in there, but I think I'll fit it in later. Um, when we talk about what you are each doing, right, you were, you, were, you were chosen for a reason. You were put on this panel for a reason. So what are you doing then in response to the changing demands of that customer, right? Whether it's millennials and their, their particular way of wanting to be sold to, treated, whether it's um, new Canadians, whether it's um, new product, new, new inventory, that if we're not exactly back to normal, we're in a constant state of change, what, do, what are the retooling efforts that you're doing to improve your overall customer experience, customer satisfaction within the construct of your own businesses? We'll go in reverse order, just to mix shit up a little. <laughs> See, it wasn't a, it wasn't a fuck. It was a shit. <laughs> it was a shit. Yeah. No. Um, it's people. I know it uh, was alluded to this morning that it's a people business, and are we really listening to people? And as I said, we sell a commodity. Anything that could be commoditized is loses value, and we got to create an experience. Yeah. So uh, to me, the business is fairly simple. Sell cars, keep customers happy, and make some money. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, it comes down to people, and... As I said, constantly evolving. So we've been focused on um, trying to hire the best team, trying to create the best staff, because the business is going to evolve and change, whether the Chinese manufacturers come in, whether we go to um, agency model, whether we go to direct sales, and whatever all the unknowns that are out there. But I still think we're going to require people to create that experience for those that are looking to acquire what we have. So. We've been focused on creating the best team we c which we could hire. Some, a little bird told me something, uh, and I, um, I think you didn't see my presentation this morning. You didn't see it. No, that's all right. Um, did you watch it on YouTube? Yes. Uh, it the was tubes. Not to me that I watched oh, the thank video. you. It's <laughs> awfully kind. Um, the um, um, how many of your general managers are women? How many? Um, we had one general manager that was women. Um, unfortunately, she left for another brand. Mm. Um, but our our goal is to, um, I don't want to put a goal out there, but our, our objective is to have our workforce be a lot more representative of the environments in which we operate in. So we have a, uh, I think what I call them, an ERG, an employee resource group that we just started and we're going to be working on um, starting with women, because there are more resources available among, rim, uh, among we we'll call it women in automotive. So we're going to be working on that. Amazing. Uh, Chris Beaton, uh, retooling. What do you, how are you retooling? How are you affecting your customer experience, customer satisfaction? Uh, very similar. It all comes down to people, and I'm sure Chris is going to... Say it's, the people thing. It's, 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 it's people a, it's business. A, it's people business? It's a people business. It all comes back to the people. You know, you can... You can have the fanciest tool, the best product, you know, I mean, the, the fanciest store, you know, all, all the, 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 the lights and pizzazz. But if you don't have the right people, you're DOA, yeah. right? It, it, uh, and that goes from, you know, top brass down to frontline employee, uh, you know, and that's really what we've been trying to do is, you know, we're really, we've been watching the premium stores very hard and because premium stores always do a very good job at customer experience. You know, selling so in much lower volume. Be looking like a domestic. We're we're not, we, we don't service that same experience. So we're trying to kind of follow follow that trend a bit. Uh, I mean, that wagon here is pretty luxurious. It's it pretty, is. Yeah. yeah. Parked at the airport now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the uh, but yeah, people. You know, as cheesy as it sounds, I have this the four P's. You know, I call it. You know, people, process, products, profits. You line those up, you're going to win. Uh, we, we first, we, we kind of took it internal and looked at, okay, what are, what are our goals and values as a, as a company? What are the goals and values of our, of our client base? And we took it from there as far as our people. Uh, you know, we went as far to, to start a DEI committee internally. You know, I, I feel very, very, very similar to yourself. You know, is, do, is, our, is the staff we have resonating with the community at large? Uh, you, know, you know, on the East Coast, where I'm from, there's a very, very... Uh, 
very high influx of immigration right now. So are we, are we, are we catering to that community? Do we, do we, do we relate to that community? Uh, you know, and not, not, to, not to avoid, uh, you know, the, the facility itself, at the same token. You know, we do have these big fancy stores, so the brick and mortar still plays a portion. So you look at experience, you know, right now I'm operating in our uh, Stellantis vertical in our group. Uh, we're, 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 we're building a Jeep track at our store, you know, to, to try, try, try it before you buy it, right? So we, we secured the land next to our property and we're building some fair similar to what you'd see at the uh, auto show. We're that is cool. Jeep track. That's very right, cool. So what's going what's to separate us out from the rest? So again, you talk about the Chinese manufacturers coming in, the Teslas of where are, where are, where are our strengths, where are our weaknesses? We've got to really play into that, right? But as far as like the four Ps, you know, once you look at our people, you know, do they all understand their roles? Do they understand their responsibilities? What role they play? And you have that proper process to, to train them. Uh, you know, and then we, start, we started uh, plugging tools on top of it. Uh, and at the same time, really looking at what, what tools and products we are utilizing. You know, car dealers, we've always been very, very quick to just add, a, add another third party widget on, another widget, another widget, and another widget that all of a sudden you have this big ecosystem of different products that are not meant to talk to each other, which now, now look at what does your data look like. So again, just, we've just been focused on the small things, I guess. The small things that cause big, big change. Control the controllables. Exactly. Chris Sage. Well, let's begin with training. I'll pick up on that that you just said, Chris. I think training is going to be paramount in the future. Um, look, things are evolving. Technology is getting a lot more complicated. I mean, I know for GM with the OnStar system, I mean, that's something that we've been focusing on. But the communication of the vehicle and the interaction with people is going to be at the forefront. People are going to be looking more and more towards that as an interest of purchasing a vehicle is what, like, an, like your iPhone, the integration or any kind of device has to be able to migrate into the vehicle. Well, that requires a lot of training. So for us, I know that we decided to hire a trainer that will train our people, not just the sales staff, but the whole team, including lot attendants, because that's another thing. Like how many of you that are in the car industry have seen your car going to service and have some scratches on it? Well, that requires training to your people. So we've surrounded herself uh, with good, solid people. You gotta invest. I, I, I'll tell you a quote from Valentine Volvo. Uh, the Valentines in Calgary are notorious for customer service. And he says, Chris, always remember a mulligan. Give your clients one mulligan. Even if it's a lie, even if they bullshit you, you know it's not true. Just do the work, take care of them. You know, that'll go a lot further. People will remember that. So I always instill that in in all the places that I've uh, opened up over the years. To, uh, to go back to another area is the relationship. I think when people come in, they gotta be able to feel immediately when they open the doors. And, and <coughs> Humi was gonna remember when we first found our, our receptionist. I think we went through seven different receptions until we found the right one. So she would get up. As soon as the second door of our dealership opens, she's already up standing the first thing that comes out of her mouth is welcome, with the biggest smile. And that person is key, because she's that, or, she, or he is the first person that someone's gonna encounter. It's the simple thing, guys. It's not as much as we think that it's technology. It's the relationships. It's every single person drinking the Kool-Aid of customer satisfaction. You gotta instill the vision in all of your people, from the lot attendant to the owner. We do an exercise when I hire a new manager, he, <laughs> he gets a little bit of a treatment. We, we make sure that we all go on the lot and pick up garbage. That's how it starts. You gotta have everyone on the same page. If there's a cigarette butt on the, on the lot, it's everyone's job to take care of it. It's that simple. All the cars have got to be in line. Everything's got to be clean. You want to differentiate yourself with the competition? Do better. Always try to always think that way. Suck, suck less. Well, suck. look, after we finish this, this, uh, this sucking stuff that you were talking about, <laughs> I, went to, <laughs> I went to you and I said, you suck. <laughs> but anyways, all joking aside, guys, I think it's... Uh, 
it's a lot of opportunity ahead of us. We, we are, maybe we're afraid a little bit of what's coming, but if you just do your job, every one of us, things the, are gonna get a lot better. I like the garbage idea. There is a, so a lot of businesses, I think very clever business, Home Depot famously, uh, if you get hired as a very a director or a higher level uh, role at Home Depot, you have to spend a certain number of time, a certain amount of time, I think it's three months, a certain number of time every day wearing the apron. You need to be out on the store floor you know, selling to customers, answering their questions to give you a sense of what everyone at retail is going through. And so that garbage idea is genius. Chris, you want to say something? Yeah, no, we, we talk about uh, customer experience a lot, but there's something to be said for employee experience as well and, and mashing those two together, you know, uh, very, very similar to yourself. You know, we, we, we ensure when we hire a new employee, they, they, they go and sit with each individual role in the dealership, again, to understand what the other person's doing to have that empathy at the same time as part of their onboarding process. It's a good segue. So my next question was, and we've touched on this a lot, we've talked a lot around it, you got a little deeper just there, but if we were gonna double click and zoom in on people, um, one of the things people ask, right, they ask like, well, uh, what was it like working at Google? Is it true the lunch is free? Like there's, like there, yes, it's true lunch is free. But um, the, the thing that I think makes Google Google and what makes every company that company is, is the people. But the thing that I think is unique about Google and what a lot of companies have chosen to emulate or trying to emulate is the way that they hire, right? And, I, and for myself, uh, I mean, a, le a learning that I'm taking away from that experience is that it's the first time I ever worked anywhere where if there was an open role, they didn't just try and fill it. Like it wasn't about a bum in a seat, which is often the phraseology people use, like we just need to hire someone to put them in that chair. Um, it was about, no, we can't fill that seats until we find the right person. So they would go to great lengths to find the right people. But with that in mind, what do you, how do you each think about hiring? You, Chris Beaton, you just kind of told us part of that yourself, but how do you think about hiring? Talk about um, how, not the who, because you talked a little bit about the who we want to hire, how you hire and, and is, is that thought of hiring and employee satisfaction part of your own retooling exercise. Um, Niall, I'll start with you, since I'm, I've been beating up the Chris's. Sure, that's I've been fine. beating up the Chris's. Um, everything is people, everything comes down to the quality of people, and um, we've been focused on reducing your staff, like the, like the, like the, churn. the, 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 churn. the, the churn or the churn of attrition there. There's an intrinsic cost to onboarding and offboarding someone that no one has ever sat down and really put the real cost to what that costs to bring an on board. So I think it starts with finding the right people, make sure the company is, the person is a fit for the company, but making sure the company is a fit for them, right? Um, what are their goals? What are their goals in life? Where are they hoping to go? Um, is the company a short-term bridge to getting them where they want to go? And I mean, we hire a lot of part-time receptionists that are in school and I joke with them, but I'm serious that they need to they need to maintain grade A's for them to keep working with me is a condition of employment. Like you're going to go to school, you're going to be in university. I'm going to give you time. I'm going to pay you for that time for you to do your homework, for you to do your your paperwork. You got to do whatever. right whatever it is you need to do. Once you answer the phones and do the basics, you could study. But I expect an A in return. Right, and I know that, um, I mean, I've been in the business 30 years and I, I've seen a lot of, um, uh, one of our young ladies, she's now a senior, a senior VP at TD. Um, so I'm not saying we had anything to do with that. She, but you had something to do with that. We had a little bit to do with it, right? She got some homework done while she was working for us. So right. it starts with people making sure you're right fit, understanding where that person role is, and I think these gentlemen all put it together. Um, you gotta walk the walk, right? Um, if you want to be a leader, I saw a saying on LinkedIn the other day, it says, if you want to keep everybody happy, go sell ice cream, right? Um, leaders don't sell ice cream. Leaders make tough decisions. You're not going to make everybody happy in your store. I tell my team, if I could make 80% of you happy, then I'm doing a damn good job, right? So leaders have got to make tough decisions. You got to make it in the best interest of the company. 
It's got to be company first, department second, personal third. So I think if you put all that together, it comes down to people having the right fit, hiring right, as you said at Google, not just filling the bum in the seat, but understanding that here's what I'm looking for, this is the skill set I need, and being patient to find that person, I, I think is going to be pay off, pay off like, like in the um, long term. I think Google did the math on that equation. Like that's part of the reason why they think that way is that they actually did the actual, they, I, they might have hired someone to do the math for them, but they actually used, they hired a consultancy to actually say, what is the cost if we have to replace this person? And they agreed, they're like, it's not worth it. Like as, if we can retain people longer, retention is actually more valuable than trying to rehire. Definitely. Yeah. Pardon? And then I left. <laughs> I was like, fuck you guys, I'm out of here. I've had enough free, I'm getting free lunch next week. I can still get free lunch, but okay. Um, Mr. Beaton. Uh, very, very similar. A lot of it comes down to top-down leadership. You know, in order to hire right, you have to know exactly who you are, where you're going, and why you're, why you're going there. In order to articulate that to your team, know who you're looking for. Uh, and, and make sure the people you're hiring are okay with change. You know, we, we live in such a or we live in, uh, work in such a, I don't know, volatile industry is the right one, but it, it's change. What, what might be the right way to do something today? Next week, we might be going the complete opposite direction. You know, it's a question I ask in every single interview is, tell me about the word change. How does it make you feel? And that one question will tell you a lot about someone if you want to hire them right there or not, right? Because people normally have very strong feelings about it. Uh, but part of the prior right, I think, comes down to uh, onboarding and, and continuous... Uh, employee engagement as well, right? So far too often we, we hire people, you know, give them a the tour around the building, show them where to go, you know, brief what's expected of them, and then they fail and we wonder why, right? Do we, are we onboarding them properly, you know? Are we having regular touch points with them? You know, are we having, you know, are we having those open door meetings? You know, do they have a monthly touch point where we can review KPIs and all that sort of thing where, again, that comes back to knowing what do we, what do we want and what do we, what do we expect out of them? I mean, I a salient question there, I think, that a lot of companies, a lot of organizations, automotive and otherwise, don't uh, appreciate is that if you hire someone and they fail, whose fault is that, right? Is that the fault of the person who you hired? We often think it's the person. It's, I think, in more cases and more often than not, it's the organization that's failed them, yeah. right? It's the organization that didn't, if they, are, if they took on that responsibility, they failed in that responsibility in some way as well. Um, Mr. Sage, do you have some sage words? <laughs> Funny guy. Um, well, let's go with the uh, onboarding. I think that's a critical component that I think we kind of lost a little bit because of various reasons. Uh, now we, it's more important now than ever before that any new people should really understand uh, everyone's position, uh, to see the faces that they're going to be interacting with, to understand their role, and spend... What we implemented recently is um, we spend almost uh, six hours with employees just to go over the simple stuff, to really f understand everything from their pay to uh, the uh, policies of the store to, uh, to, to the various roles. And, and we invite each manager from each department to go and talk and to talk a little bit briefly about them. So the, the expectation is such. Um, but the other critical component, and you alluded to it, is to find the right person to begin with. And, and that requires effort and to be smart. I think in this day and age, there's so many tools like uh, we use Harrison uh, personality assessment, and, and we also do a bit of an IQ test um, in most of the stores that I've operated. This particular store that I'm at right now, the owners doesn't really believe in doing that, but I. I think I'm going to get the better of him soon now that we've go through people. It really makes a difference when you know it's not so much for, for you to know who they are, it's for you to know how to interact with them. Because when you understand someone's personality, you're able to adapt yourself to how to train them. It's not always about us, it's about them too because it's an investment, and you briefly alluded to the investment component. I mean, I, I heard numbers from forty to $80,000 per person when they leave. Well, holy jeez, 
you want to make sure that you do your damn best to get the right person coming in. There's some position, though, uh, that I found over the years that uh, you got to hire more. And, and look, this new generation that's coming in, and, and no one here, please don't get offended. I, I, I call them marshmallow, okay? And, and it's tough because they don't, there's certain values that's missing. And, uh, and I blame myself a little bit because I have maybe one of them. That's a marshmallow. But I love him to death. And, and uh, there's not a day that it goes by that we try to, to interact. So, but as he gets older, and that's the thing, it takes longer for them to mature. Right? So you got to invest in these people. What, what is a marshmallow? Sorry. Give, the, give me the Reader's well, Digest on what a marshmallow is. So when you push and you let go, it comes right back to how it was. Okay. So those people that are coming in, unfortunately, I find that they don't have the same level of loyalty, if you want, or, or commitment to see it through. You know, you hire these people, you, you think you did everything right, and the next thing you know, they leave. And it could be just because you said something wrong or you just looked the wrong, the long, the wrong way to them. You didn't smile, you didn't say good morning to them. Right? Those are the things that you got to pay close well, attention to. smile more, damn it, Chris. I know. Let I've me. got Umi over there. That guy over there he smiles he, all the time. He says good morning to everyone every day. He, he's smiling now. He's smiling now. He seems happy. You know, but you, you got to learn from that. I really yeah. think so. Okay. Uh, how are we doing for time? I don't want to go over again. I'm good. How much time do I have? How many? 30 minutes, great, I got lots of questions, let's do this. Um, I am gonna jump around a little bit though because I think this is more interesting. Um, I was asked on a podcast a little while ago because I think this leads more naturally conversationally, um, how do we build trust with customers? That there's still a sense that it, at dealership level, that I'm gonna get screwed. That if I come to get service or buy cards or good scent, uh, the average consumer believes, they don't know how, but they feel like there's a high probability they're gonna get shafted somehow. And so when you hear that, you know, in your opinion, what are the ways consumer preferences and behaviors influence what you do? How do you, how do you adjust that? How are you trying to address the notion of trust at, at your dealerships, at your businesses. Who wants to take it? I think it goes back to what you said earlier, you're still waiting for the call from the Toyota dealership. I'm, I'm still waiting for right? that it, call. It, 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 starts, it starts with that, it starts with that, that graph, that picture you put up right there, that's exactly it. You know, uh, the touch points. The touch points, if you, went, if you went to Amazon and put something I wanna buy this and put it in your cart, and then had to wait two days for a response for how much it was gonna be, would you trust Amazon? Would you would you frequent there? And that's it's really what it comes down to. So you bought from the brick, then? Uh, no, yeah. that's right. That's uh, <laughs> so I think, I think a lot of it comes back to that. It's just how we're how we're handling people. You know, and I yeah. think a lot of it comes back just to that customer experience, hospitality. You know, that's it, and all the things that we kind of everyone alluded to this morning as well. It's just how we're treating the people and just giving people the common courtesy. You know, if they have a question, answer it. You know, and is our our our, our marketing efforts aligned? You know, or are you going to go on one page and get one price, then go on another tool on another site, and it's another price, and then only to come to the store and get a whole other story, and then you wonder why people don't trust us, right? Are we, are we, are we educating them enough, or is our omnichannel efforts consistent for what's happening in person? And I think that a lot of that comes back to, I don't know. Are we talking about eShop? Do you have problems with eShop, Chris? Is there something you want to, something you want to get off your chest a bit? No? Yeah. no? Too close. Yeah. It's too close to home. Too close. Um, gentlemen, now, thoughts? I still, you know, go back to the experience economy and goes back to yeah. um, creating value. You know, uh, the adage I say in the stories all the time, if I'm buying a Nissan, within 30 minutes, how many Nissan stores could I get to? Then if I add Toyota, I add Mazda, and I add the domestic brands, how many stores could I get to? There's nothing that we're selling that I can't get anywhere else. Commodified, it's commodity. It's a commodity. But how do you create that experience, right? And so it's being empathetic, it's being 
transparent, is being truthful. I think you've got to earn people's trust. I um, mean, I could, it's a bit of a sidebar, but I'll give you an example from on Monday. Um, good friend of mine, he's, I've known him for about 25 years. When he bought his car three and a half years ago, he bought it with the intention of buying it out. He lives in Georgetown, works downtown Toronto. He knew he was going to put on a lot of mileage on his car. I want the lowest payment I could get today. No problem. Think you're making the wrong decision, but that's what we're going to do. So come around time to buy out his lease. His buy out is 21.5. He puts on an extended warranty. He's got gap insurance. And he's got um, job loss insurance. And with taxes, he's at six to grand. Um, so he calls me up and he says, Niall, I'm buying this truck for six to grand. Like, how do I get here? How did I get to six to grand? So I said, let me call the general manager and get him on the phone. And because I'm not at the store, and let's walk through how we get to six to grand. So toward a one five for your car, four Gs for the extended warranty, and da 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 da. I, and I said to him, I said, I think you're better off getting into a new car. I said, put some money down have a little bit of an extra higher payment, but you have already paid like $30,000 for this car over the course of the lease to buy the same car out for another six to grand. You're buying a $100,000 car and it's going to be eight years old. So, I mean, he went in yesterday, bought a new car. His payment is about 200 bucks more than he wanted to, but this time we got him some extra mileage. So he's not in that position. But He's not underwater. But you got to have that you got to have that empathy. you got to have that trust. Like, we're not their financial advisor. We could just give them the best advice. It's like people that come and buy cars for cash, right? right? Um, you know, you could just Google what I could get in a GSC. You could get 5.7 for a tangerine for a year. So are, are our salespeople educated enough to do the basic math for a guest to show, well, here is what it's going to cost in interest. Here is your delta on cash, because are people using real cash? Are they using a line of credit, or what are they using? And if you were to take that cash and put it in a GIC, or if you go to a one-pay lease, right, depending on the manufacturer, you only pay interest on the first payment. So take that cash, get a one-pay lease instead of cash, and then put the rest of the money aside, right? So what you've got to build trust, you've got to build empathy, and you've got to build rapport and you got to be authentic about it because people could smell bullshit from a mile away. Well, see, this won't work real well because I was going to ask you a follow-up question, and that is, do you have a personal finance YouTube channel I can check out? Because I think I'd like to watch that. If you don't, we should talk later. And uh, maybe we can use the studio here at the Alma Combo to film it. That would be great. Shalou, where are you? Where are you Mike, yeah? Done. You said done. Um, that's incredible. And I think that that is the problem, right? That the, the consumer doesn't know. Like, the consumer doesn't know. Even someone who's probably fairly affluent, who thinks they know what they're doing with their money, when they walk into a dealership, they're... they're Ignorant, like the word is, and not in, like, they're li by the pure definition of the word, unless they actually work in the industry, unless they, and even in many cases when they do, um, they don't know, they don't understand what you just explained. Yeah. You, gotta be, you have to be passionate about what you do. I love the car business. I tell people I haven't worked a day in the last 20 years. I love what I do. This is not work for me. Um, you know, you have to be passionate about it, and I think if you're passionate about it and genuine about it, like that comes true. Continue. Yeah, so I don't have the YouTube, I don't have the YouTube channel, won't have one, because being on stage here is, um, is a thank you to my friends at SM360, because I'm the guy in the background, I don't like the limelight, I just like to, I just like to do the work and let the work speak for itself, you know? Um, we build trust. Otherwise. Yeah, I th thank you for bringing that back. Uh, yes, trust. I think it can start really simply. Let's go back to Google. Um, 
Let's go with the reviews. How many of you take the time to answer every single review? That's what people look at these days. And I would tell you, don't be afraid to put your name there and answer. Take the time to answer every single review. It goes a long way. That's how you're going to build trust, in my opinion. When people start seeing, even the bad ones, it's how you answer those reviews. Right? We're not perfect. No one's expecting you to be perfect. But they want to see that you give a shit, that you care. And so I would tell you, if I had to tell you in one quick second for trust, would be to watch your Google reviews. Um, the other component I would tell you is how you pay your people. Mm. If you pay your people on commission, on gross profit, then they're focusing on them and not focusing on the customer. And that's something we change very rapidly at our store. So I give them a base. It doesn't matter if they sell a $2,000 car or 150 or in some cases 250. Um, they're all getting paid the same. Uh, we give them a salary so they don't have to stress out at the end of the month or at the midpoint of the month. And we give them a nice bonus on per unit sold and a volume bonus as well. Pay plans are important to motivate, but to also to make sure that the intent is not to give, like if a client comes in on a Toyota Tercel, I still remember that car. It was a great car. And I remember I was guilty of this because I was paid by commission back in, oh my goodness, I'm dating myself. I started in 1988. Anyways, I didn't want to take care of those customers because I didn't get paid properly. So I just walked them, right? Not thinking that that client would come back and buy maybe one day a more expensive car and then refer me to the client because I was young and foolish. But that's the stuff, guys. You got to be watching is also the pay plan is what I would go with. I mean, are you, are you, thank you for the new battery. Thank you. Um, are you incentivizing the right behavior, right, is kind of what that comes down to. There is, I will tell a sidebar a little story. Saf, you will remember this. Uh, the, so I, in my job at Google, like, I, I learned very early on that um, I would get called into various meetings and I would have kind of a thought about what I was meeting or who I was meeting and, and arrive, and it was not that all of the time. And there was one guy in particular, further sidebar, who I worked with from Ford, and he was just so bad at explaining the context of what I would walk into. Sometimes it meant I would walk into a room thinking it would be a full boardroom and it would be three people. It would be three people, just like, or two people. And other times, I would be thinking it would be a full boardroom, and it was a hall of 200 people. Like, I literally didn't, I was like, what, if, if this guy's asking, know that you have no idea what you're getting into. But um, there are a couple of Ford dealers that are not unlike that, and so there was a Ford dealer who's very, very focused on replying to every single review. I would tell you. Yeah. Well, he's not Ford anymore. He's now a JLR store. He? Yeah, J he's now at a JLR store. He, but saw, he saw the light. <laughs> <laughs> he saw something. He saw so I don't know. What. I got two people that joined us because of the Google review, the way that they got responded on the review. It instilled confidence and wanted to work for a company that would actually take the care of responding to each individual, but also on the response. Our parts manager that we recently hired told me, he says, that's the only reason I join you, is I like your vision, and I like the way you respond to people. It's with care, and it's with intelligence, and with facts. So that's important. You don't just reply to review. You get exactly what happened, so you can reply back. So it's, it's a bit more important, guys, I would tell you. Look at that carefully in your business. There is, so I knew a, I, another Ford dealership that in their own recruitment effort for hiring, many years ago, the, it was the only reason, the only strategic reason why they did this, they created a podcast. They created a podcast, and the only reason they did it was they wanted to tell people who they were. They wanted to, like, they didn't think there was any other way to explain to people, like, who they were as a business and how they thought about business. And that was, that was it. It wasn't trying, they didn't want to be Joe Rogan. They weren't trying to build any, they didn't want anyone to click through anything. They just wanted to, like, this is who we are. So you're absolutely right. I think that's brilliant. If you can show people, you know, what it's the classic, when people show you who they are, listen, right? Like, listen when they, yeah. I'm going to add one more, if you don't mind, Hit guys. It. Go ahead. Because you guys talked a lot this last little <laughs> bit, so it's my turn now. Um, 
The I sage would tell advice, you the sage advice. Sage that's, advice. That's I your could, YouTube channel. That, that's the YouTube channel. Yeah. I would tell you the other thing that I noticed that has also been beneficial over time is your social media. It's how you uh, position yourself, how you uh, advertise yourself, how you keep consistent in helping in the community, posting those involvement that you do, genuine involvement. Uh, people start seeing trust in also seeing what you do for others. It's not just about you and making money. It's about what you're also capable of doing and getting your team involved. I'll give you an example. We did a, um, for, pl for the Earth Day that just happened, uh, I think it was last uh, two weeks ago. We brought uh, our entire team, or half our team anyway, some of them had to work, uh, to a park. And we cleaned up the entire park. And we posted it on social. Well, you should see, we had people from the city workers honking their horn high-fiving us, saying, wow, that's great. And we made sure that everyone had a Strickland shirt or jacket, so they knew it was Strickland. It's the little things that uh, gets you to build trust, you know? So anyways, a little segue on that one. Was that your new GM? You sent him out to pick up more trash? Was that the, the was that the? Well, uh, was I, that? I ended up picking up the most garbage that day, but oh. I just focus on the big piece. So it's not I, a contest, I, yeah. Chris. <laughs> well, I'm very competitive, what can I say? <laughs> Mr. Beaton. A goose example, you know, in the, in the back of the house, talk about service for an example. Uh, you know, every every single customer's car that comes through our service department, we throw it up in a hoist, and we actually send them a personalized, customized video of the repair. So we're not just going to call them and try and get a technician to go up to a service advisor, explain complicated repair to an advisor, now advisor call a customer and try and explain that same complicated repair. We actually send them a video, you know, and they can actually approve it right from their phone. and. Just this one little thing, our CSI went from here to here. Dollars per hour went from here to here. Because people will pay more if they trust you. You know, and it's just, in the same, you could use another example from the front of the house, but don't think you need to. It's just be trustworthy, just show them, show them you care. Just pull the, pull the veil back. The information's out there, so. That's also a good segue. So, um, so I think I, this question wasn't exactly in here, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, but there's a version of it, so surprise, surprise wild card, wild card. Um, you alluded to um, uh, Brian Benstock uses the phrase the pizza box problem, like that it's the every piece of technology you're just stacking this on top of this on top of this, and none of them communicate. They're in siloed boxes on top of each other. Um, if you were, and the problem right now is you all agree too much, and that's been lovely, that's been really warm and, and welcoming, but now I want you to disagree. Now I want you to disagree. Um, have some contrarian ideas, or n new ideas. If you were a technology startup, so if you were like, say you're like five, five guys in a room and you decided for whatever reason, probably ill-advised, that you want to target the automotive industry, what solution would you build? Like what is the, what is the problem that has not yet been addressed that you know you wake up and you're like, if only there was a, like if only there was a tool that did this, if only there was a solution that solved this problem, I would buy it almost like without hesitation. Asking for a friend. God, you're really pushing your envelope today, I tell you. Uh, I'll start with this one, guys, just to give you a bit of time to think about it. Um, I would say one of the biggest issues I've encountered over the years is, um, in this last little bit, is the recalls and the software uploads that uh, you have to get yet to the dealership a lot of times, and bandwidth are not quite capable, and it also occupies our bays. And I would really like to see, uh, I know VW is working diligently towards it, but it should be able to be done at night when the car is parked in the driveway or, or underground parking and, and do all those software recalls so we don't have to be uh, making our clients come to the dealership to just do a recall. Though, look, I'm not complaining. It gives us an opportunity to to talk to them and sell them another car, but at the end of the day, it should be about the customer experience and, and not wasting their time. So that would be my uh, uh, wish for technology, yeah. Chris? Some sort of activity barometer, we'll call it, where, you know, and as, as more data comes into our ecosystem and some way to centralize this into, 
uh, some BI center where a salesperson, let's say, wants to be successful, and we have our, all of our benchmarks and our KPIs, and are you above the line, below the line? There's different variations of this out there now, but just one quick dashboard, per se, that you want to be successful, go do these X, Y, Z things, and based off not what some trainer told you or what, uh, what your GM told your salesperson, what you're, what you're doing in real time, do these things, and your data says you will book an appointment or sell a car or whatever. So, like, so a... What did you call it? Activity barometer? You know, that's what you're? Yeah. Activity barometer. And that would be like a better view of the activity. You're, you're focused right now on service, but like across the dealership of the, yeah. you know, like just a where where am I bleeding money? Where am I ripe? Like where, is, where are things good? Where are they bad? Just give me a directional indicator of I need to go you know, poke this person in the eye or retrain exactly. this person. Kind or, of a global view for a, let's, say, let's look at the sales department, a global view for a sales manager or GM. There's different levels of view. Yeah, yeah. Viewing and then one for a salesperson, you know, geez, I'm struggling. You know, it's the 23rd of the month and I'm, I'm, be, I'm behind target. What's going on? What do we do? And I can, yeah. I, can, I can dig into my BI reports and say, here's where my opportunities right. are. Here's, well, where, here's where my problems are, but problems is... is Chris, a, you just complained to marketing. They need more leads. That's yeah. what you, yeah. 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 That's, Sorry. That's what we call in comedy a callback. That's a callback. Um, but even on, on leads, you know, I mean, how many times did you did they follow up with lead? Like right. All that, all that pipeline one, management, e like e the exa exactly, right? Yeah. You know, because sometimes again, it's made, are the leads crap or is the person crap, right? And or both. Yeah, or both. Or neither. Yeah. Niall. magic wand. You wave your magic wand. This magical new piece of technology lands in your dealership. What is it? I think the technology exists today in a CDP. Um, I think the CRM has evolved, and um, we need to get all of that in one place and have consistent communication, because what we have right now are all silos. As, as Brian said, we got the pizza boxes, and pizza boxes. I got service sending them one communication. I got sales running a sales event sending them a different communication, and then I got a marketing team sending them a different message. So how do we um, get all the data in one place and have one true source of data um, uh, and one true source of data that we know it's accurate and then manage the communication going out. And I mean, the larger Fortune 500 companies, they all use them. So it exists already today is how do we, how do we get it to be cost effective? Yeah. Like at a dealership level, I, th I think is the real question. Right. It exists, but it's, it exists at a enterprise level, at an enterprise price point. So... How do you, and you should totally should be able to do this. Um, how do you right size that? Pr you know, price it in a way that it makes sense for the economics of a dealership. Interesting. Um, let's talk dangerous question. I love this one. Uh, let's talk crust here. How do you feel about your OEMs? No. Um, when you think about cross your marketing operations from where you sit today, from your perspective, what's the state of working with your OEM? Um, you know, talk about how it is, how it could be better, what you wish. Again, magic wand. If you could wave a magic wand, what would you like it to be versus how it is? So articulate how it is. This is a safe space, mostly. Is there anybody from Windsor here? There, well, I don't think there's, there's anyone no from Windsor here. There's no... Do I mean like Stellantis Windsor? Yeah, I don't yeah. think you've ever worked for. You're not a member of the Tea Party. Yeah, you don't. You're not in the band the Tea Party, and you don't work for Stellantis. You're fine. I'll, you're fine. I'll, I'll answer this one very safe. Uh, it's, it's never been more important with all the change in our industry right now to make sure you have an active voice on your dealer councils and all your regional boards. Right? There's a lot of moving parts yeah. right now. You look at even just pick one, pick data, and who owns that data, and just it's never, ever, ever been more important to have a seat at the table and have an active member and be engaging with your dealer council members. And if you have an opportunity to get on either a national or a regional board, make sure you do. You can't complain about how the country's being run if you don't vote. Right. So that's, yeah. my, sa that's my safe answer. Th th I mean, that's a good answer. That's a pretty good answer. Gentlemen on the wings. Yo, um, we have import dealers only, so um, have a, a pretty good relationship with the dealers, and I remember when I went to NADA school, my instructor said, walk outside 30 feet, look up 30 feet, 
and the sign in the building is why you're here. <laughs> right? So, you know, uh, you have to maintain a symbolic relationship with your manufacturer. Not every idea they're going to bring is great. Um, you got to be respectful in how you say no, because not everything they're going to ask you to do, you're going to want to do. Um, but I think it's important to maintain that relationship with them because, as you alluded to, um, the path is unknown. The path is unknown. There's a lot of changes coming. And they got a role to play. We got a role to play. And, and we've got to get there. We got to get there together. Because ultimately, in every transaction, they're winners and losers. But collectively, me and all of us essentially need to be winning. Uh, that's good. Yes. At, at the end of the day, you're all trying to do the same thing. You're trying to. Mr. I'll Sage. Go, I'll go back to the communication aspect of uh, integration with various aspects of all the people that are at the manufacturer level is to have a relationship with all of them, not just a few. And, and you're a good point, uh, because they all have a, a role to play to your success. And they genuinely, I would say, the manufacturer has no interest at not making you successful. They want you to succeed. So let's start with that. So once you've got that mindset, then you can start breaking those barriers and issues that are, might be in front of you. But to your point, you got to sit at the table. And even if you may not be involved at some committee, but be aware of what's going on and, and seek out for their help and assistance. Because the more you go out and, and ask for help, I find that it doesn't matter if it's the manufacturer or, or anyone. The more you ask for assistance, the more people want to give you assistance. Everyone genuinely cares when you really look at it. So that would be my take on, on the relationship aspect. But did you have anything else you wanted to know? I don't know. I think we're all right. Oh, good. Anyway, okay. Well, and I would say we, uh, the, you know, an operating principle within Google was simply that you should assume best intentions. Right? Like, and I think that that is a, um, whether, whether it's true or not, uh, is a different story, whether or not everyone is actually doing best intentions. But I do agree with, you know, again, through the lens of control the controllables, that whether you're a dealer or an OEM, the, the assume best intentions is probably the best way to approach any of those conversations. Because at the end of the day, you're just trying to move the fucking metal. Well, you're just trying to sell the cars. Right. There's the F word. There is the fucking. No, that's fine. And on that note, and I, yeah, I think where are you, yeah, Mr. Shulu, I think we're good. We're good. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for tolerating Thank me. Thanks, everyone.